Greg Peterson here, and I want to thank you for listening to the Urban Farm Podcast. We wouldn't be able to keep doing these great shows without you. So as a token of my appreciation, I'd like to offer you access to a list of our top 10 episodes I personally find most inspiring. If you enjoy the Urban Farm Podcast but don't have time to listen to every one, then you will love this list. Although all our guests have great information to offer, if you are short on time, these 10 are must-listens. To get access to the top 10 most inspiring podcast episodes, text FARMER to 44222. That's FARMER to 44222. And enjoy listening. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the grow your own food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Gene Bauer of Farm Sanctuary to talk about his experience with protecting farm animals. Gene is co-founder and president of Farm Sanctuary, a national nonprofit organization working to end cruelty to farm animals and change the way society views and treats them. Hailed as the conscience of the food movement by Time Magazine and recently selected by Oprah to join her Super Soul 100 dream team of 100 awakened leaders who are using their voices and talent to elevate humanity, He was a pioneer in undercover investigations and instrumental in passing the first U.S. laws to ban inhumane factory farming practices. He has traveled extensively, campaigning to raise awareness about the abuses of animal agriculture and our cheap food system. He is the author of two national best-selling books, Farm Sanctuary, Changing Hearts and Minds About Animals and Food, and Living the Farm Sanctuary Life, The Ultimate Guide to Eating Mindfully, Living Longer, and Feeling Better Every Day. Gene has a master's degree in agricultural economics from Cornell University and is a faculty member at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And he has been a vegan since 1985 and recently started competing in marathons and triathlons, including an Ironman to demonstrate the benefits of eating plant-based. Welcome to the show today, Gene. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me on. Oh my gosh, I am so excited to chat with you today. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Yeah, well, I grew up in the Hollywood Hills in California, and I remember seeing beautiful old oak trees in the neighborhood being cut down, and that just Ouch. bothered me. Yeah. I, yeah I, I also saw wild animals being harmed by human activities, and I felt that I didn't want to be a cog in a wheel of a system that was causing so much harm. So that's really where this all began for me. And then I just started exploring ways to make a positive difference and not to cause the kind of harm that I was seeing around me. And as time went and as I learned about the factory farming industry and about how each of us make food choices every day that are contributing to this problem, I decided to go vegan in 1985, wow. go down to farm sanctuary in 1986, and I've been doing this ever since. Wow. So farm sanctuary, tell us about that. You know, Farm Sanctuary works to change how our society views and treats farm animals. Uh Most of us grow up eating meat, dairy, and eggs without really thinking about it. And that was the case with me, too. I grew up eating meat, Uh and I didn't recognize the kind of harm that I was contributing to. But once I learned about it, and when I learned that I could live well without eating any animal products, Uh it was a very easy decision for me. So this whole notion, you you called it vegan. Some people call it plant-based um why is it why is this important yeah well you know i think most people are compassionate and most people would rather not contribute to unnecessary suffering of other animals or of other people for that matter and most of us grow up with habits that contribute to enormous suffering but the fact is we can live very well eating plants and not animals we can live in a way that causes less harm to the planet. In fact, the United Nations put out a report a couple years ago where they talked about how animal agriculture is one of the top contributors to our planet's most serious environmental problems. 
Mm -hmm. including climate change, including the loss of biodiversity. So by changing the way we eat, we can improve our lives, we can improve the lives of others, and we can make make our planet healthier as well. So you've been vegan then since 1985, and I, I see in your... Uh, in your bio that you do marathons, triathlons, including an Ironman, congratulations. And you're doing yeah, this, you. you're doing this to demonstrate the benefits of a, a plant-based eating. Uh, what kind of changes? So, you know, some of my listeners, if they've been listening to my show, they know I've been doing this plant-based diet for now for about six months. And I've actually seen some pretty extraordinary results what what kind of results have you seen? Because you've been doing it now for over 30 years. Yeah, yeah no, I've been a vegan most of my life yeah. now. And, you know, for me, changing how I ate was primarily beneficial emotionally because I knew that I wasn't causing unnecessary harm mm -hmm. and I wasn't tormented by that. But physically, I've also never had any problems, so that's a good thing. What I found, though, is I was training for marathons and the Ironman triathlon when you're burning an awful lot of calories. I found that I just needed to eat more food. Right. And it helped me get more in touch with my body and to realize that eating healthy, whole food, deep, leafy green vegetables, for example, mm -hmm. was something that really nourished my body and allowed it to perform well. Nice. Nice. So one of the things that I've noticed in the last six months is that, and this is surprising to me, is that I'm I'm not hungry. It's like, a, it's a, yes. a, a, the cravings, a lot of the cravings have gone away and I'm not hungry. When you eat food that is nourishing, you don't crave other foods. And, you know, unfortunately, many people in our country are eating food that is high in calories and low in nutrition. Mm. And so they remain hungry and they keep eating this junk, which puts on weight mm -hmm. and, and burdens our bodies yeah. and eating a whole foods plant-based diet is such a great way to live to get rid of some of these unnecessary ailments that we face in our country that mm -hmm. have become commonplace and yeah. so yeah I think your experience is, is one that a number of people have, have, have shared and it makes all the sense in the world if, if we can eat well without causing harm without hurting our own health why wouldn't we yeah yeah, well, and honestly, one of the bonuses for me is I'm down about 14 pounds in six months. And again... Yeah, you know, the huge issue in our country is being overweight, obesity, uh -huh. heart disease. All of those issues can be addressed by shifting to a whole foods, plant-based diet. Yeah, one of the, so I, I, Jim Loomis has been our guest on the show uh, in the past, and we had this conversation, the medical... Uh, background of why why eat a plant-based diet but one of the things that he spoke a lot about was it changes it helps change your gut flora so that your gut flora is happier and healthier yes we human beings are part of this earth and what we eat becomes us and we create a social ecosystem with you know who we choose to hang around with uh -huh. and we create an environmental ecosystem by the way we behave on the planet, whether we're cutting down trees and putting in cement or whether we're living in nature. So we treat this environmental ecosystem. Yeah. And what we eat has a huge impact on our gut ecosystem, the yeah. flora. So eating a healthy diet allows our guts to develop healthy bacteria and healthy microorganisms. And I've heard people talk about how our gut is sort of like our soil. Yeah. And if you have healthy soil, you can grow healthy plants. Mm -hmm. And if we have an unhealthy gut with, you know, foods that are have toxins in them, have too many animal proteins, too much fat, that creates an unhealthy gut, unhealthy soil, and it really impacts our, our personal health and well-being. Yeah. Well, I just, I know that over the past six months, I feel better. I've lost weight. I have people telling me, oh my gosh, you look great. So... Something's working here, and it's an experiment for me. So, and you know, if you feel good physically, uh -huh. that also helps you to feel good emotionally. Yeah, you know, as opposed to being constantly in pain or or suffering from some chronic uh, problem that, in many cases, can be prevented. That's the amazing thing about this, right. and I, I think it's so empowering for people. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. people get used to things that are not healthy, and you know, they, they might have lactose intolerance, for example, and still be drinking cow's milk 
and just assume that, well, this is how life is. Mm -hmm. I have these chronic problems with my digestion. But getting away from those unhealthy foods can change an awful lot, and, yeah. and we can get rid of a lot of these chronic problems that way. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. What I've been seeing is that my health has been improving. So let's jump over to Farm Sanctuary. So what do most people not realize about the way farm animals are treated here in America? Well, in the U.S., farm animals are seen primarily as commodities, not as living, feeling creatures. Mm -hmm. They live in small cages or crates where they're packed so tightly they can't even move. They're crowded by the thousands in these massive warehouses that have toxic air because their waste and the fumes that emit from those. The animals live horrible lives. And then they're slaughtered, obviously, which is, is not a positive experience for the animals. Yeah. It's not a positive experience for people either. You know, I've been into slaughterhouses, and I've seen what those places do to people. And, you know, can you imagine what it would be like to work in a slaughterhouse where for eight hours a day your job is cutting the throats of animals? Wow. It's a violent bloody job and it really has an impact yeah. and you know I, I believe that you know violence tends to create more violence and our food system is hugely violent the way it is now yeah and i think that that violence spread through our society and by choosing a plant-based diet we are then supporting a different kind of food, food system mm -hmm. one that is less violent more respectful and then and it just becomes part of who we are i think yeah well, so, and that's for animals that are being butchered for us to eat. What about, and this was my question for the, for the longest time, the difference between vegan and vegetarian. Why is it bad to eat cheese? Yeah, well, for cows to produce milk, they have to have babies. They're, they're mammals, just like human beings and other mammals. And they don't lactate just for the heck of it. They lactate to keep their young. On modern dairy farms, cows are impregnated every year and give birth. Their calf is taken away from them immediately at birth. Mm. And so the milk can be sold for human consumption. If the calf is a female, she's raised to become a milking cow because the dairy cows are pushed very hard. They produce about 10 times more milk than they would naturally. They're worn out after just about three years in production, and then they're sent to slaughter for beef. And so they need a constant supply of these young female calves to replace the dairy cows in the herd. The male calves are useless to the dairy industry. So the veal industry was actually created to oh. take advantage of this plentiful supply of unwanted male calves born on dairy farms. So those are some inherent problems. Yeah. We have baby calves taken from their mothers so that human beings can take and consume the milk. Well, there you have it. Wow. Yeah, and, and you know, in terms of being vegetarian or vegan, uh -huh. You know, for me, being vegan is an aspiration to live as kindly as possible. I think the term vegan for many people can seem scary and it can seem untouchable or, or uh, very strident. But, but to me, it's an aspiration. And just living on this planet, we're causing harm, you know, when we drive cars or do other things like that. But if we can aspire to live as kindly as possible and to eat plant foods instead of animal food and to just continuously be mindful, that to me is what being vegan is. It's, it's not so much an ingredient list as an intention to live with compassion. Yeah, I can so totally get that. A few years ago, I decided, given I wasn't a vegetarian, this is oh, five or six or seven years ago, that I was going to go ahead and raise some meat birds here at the urban farm and I raised them from chick to plate and I did the whole thing all the way from a you know a day old chick to eating it on my plate and after I did that we did it for about 25 birds over the course of two years and after I did that I was actually much more appreciative of you know humanely raised meat and much more of a vegetarian even five years ago uh, just because I, I put myself through that process because I, I was still eating meat back then and I figured, you know what, if I'm going to eat poultry, I need to figure out where it comes from. And so that was quite the learning experience for me. Yeah. No, I think that most people are very removed from the source of their food. Yeah. And there's a growing interest now in recognizing where our food comes from 
and ultimately, I think most people want to feel good about where their food comes from yeah. instead of saying, don't tell me, I don't want to know, which is often the case when it comes to factory farming. Right, exactly. But when you look at where, you know, where, you look at where our food comes from and you realize you can live well without killing, um, it just feels so satisfying. Yeah. And for those who kill animals, you know, I feel badly for them. And I think we have to sort of distance ourselves from them and and then rationalize our our killing behaviors and it reminds me of during the salem witch hunts back in the 1600s uh-huh. in massachusetts the executioners who were told that they had to kill the witches were also told not to look into the witches eyes because if they did the mm. witches would cast a spell on them yeah. and they couldn't kill them basically when you look into somebody's eyes and you see there is somebody there you see that there's a sentient creature you tend to have empathy yeah. And that's a very healthy human quality. And I think when we are going to kill other animals and treat them just like pieces of meat, there's this tendency to not empathize. Yeah. And that tendency can jump the species barrier. That kind of lack of consideration for somebody else uh, doesn't only apply to animals. And it's, and it's been shown over and over that cruelty to animals often leads into cruelty to people as well. Yeah. Yeah. I know this is a heavy, heavy topic, everybody out there listening, and uh, thanks for sticking with us because it's a very important topic. Whether you're uh, eating a plant-based diet or whether you're not, it's just, this is all something to learn about. One of Farm Sanctuary's most important values is that we speak to people where they are on their own journeys, uh-huh. and we accept people where they are on their own journeys, and we just encourage people to try to do better. You know, and even though I've been a vegan for many years, I can still do better in terms of eating more organic food, Mm -hmm. eating more locally produced food, supporting farmers who I get to know. So I'm still a work in progress. Yeah. Even the most vegan vegan is not perfect. None of us is perfect. And we're all just trying to do the best we can. And and Farm Sanctuary wants to help people take steps in a positive direction. Even if people are meat eaters, we just encourage them to start shifting towards eating more plants. Yeah. So it's all a process we're all part of. Absolutely. I tell people all the time that you do the best that you can right now with the data and the information that you have. And, you know, if something changes down the road, if you learn, you do something different, yay. Exactly. So. Exactly. And if you do something that ultimately you feel was not ideal or, or was a mistake, don't beat yourself up too much about it. Exactly. Recognize it and then learn from it and do better next time. and forgive yourself absolutely yes absolutely so, so tell us about your new best-selling book living the farm sanctuary life the ultimate guide to eating mindfully living longer and feeling better every day yeah living the farm sanctuary life is really a how-to book it talks about setting up your plant-based kitchen it includes over a hundred amazing recipes from great vegan chefs and restaurant Ooh, owners. Nice. Some of, some of those are really fancy. Some of them are very simple. So there's something for everybody when it comes to the recipes. And there's an outline about why it makes sense to go plant-based. So it's, it's a great resource for people that are curious about living in a way that is more compassionate, mm-hmm. healthier, and more sustainable for the planet. Way cool. Give us a couple of tips. Well, it's getting easier and easier now to find plant-based substitutes for animal food. So, for example, people who like spaghetti and meatballs Mm -hmm. can still have spaghetti and meatballs, but instead of using meatballs from animals, you can use vegan or plant-based meatballs. Uh You can also just substitute all kinds of veggies in your marinara sauce with your spaghetti. So there's those kinds of things. There's all types of plant-based veggie burgers now you can use instead of hamburgers. You could also use a portobello mushroom in place of a burger, if you'd like. Those are really tasty. Mushrooms are amazing. Beans are a great source of protein, and they also have a lot of fiber and nutrients. So those are a really good thing to eat instead of animal foods. Mm -hmm. And it's also become so easy now to find plant-based alternatives to cow's milk. You know, in addition to soy milk, you also have almond milk, coconut milk, cashew milk, rice milk, hemp milk. so many different kinds, and there are also combinations, and you have different flavors. You have vanilla, you have plain, sweetened, unsweetened, chocolate. You know, so it's gotten amazing the types of varieties out there now. Yeah. 
and we're even finding vegan cheeses. So it's getting easier than ever. And I would just encourage people to experiment and explore the different plant-based foods that are out there and try different ones and, and use the ones you like the best. Yeah. I, you know, I recently ate at a restaurant here in Phoenix and they had a gluten-free pizza crust with vegan uh, cheese on top of it. And I have to tell you, that was one of the better pizzas that I've had in the last decade. You know, vegan chefs are really upping their game. Yeah. And some of the top restaurants in the world are now vegan or they have vegan dishes. And, you know, they're demonstrating that by eating plants instead of animals, we don't give up anything. We don't give up any flavor or any texture yeah. or, or satisfaction. And it's a very exciting time for people that are choosing to eat plant food. And choosing to eat better because I think the whole food game has been upped in the past couple of years. Absolutely. I think people are hungry for good food. <laughs> You know, especially when people are suffering from preventable health problems yeah. and their lives are not as fulfilling or as energized as they could be. And, and people feel disempowered uh, by making bad food choices. So yeah, I think people do want to eat better. People yeah. want to live healthy, energized lives and to be empowered to live in a way ultimately that is aligned with our own values and aligned with our own interests, which are some of the key messages in the book, Living the Farm Sanctuary Life. Yeah. Because most people are humane and would not rather not support cruelty. But at the same time, most people are unwittingly supporting this horrible food system by eating animal products. Yeah. So there's a misalignment there, and there is this dissonance between people's compassion and their food choices. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be that way. We can align our compassion with our food choices by eating plants instead of animals, and we should eat food that is aligned with our interest. Instead of eating food that makes us sick, like we do in this country, uh -huh. we can eat food that nourishes us and energizes us and empowers us. It's been estimated that we could save 70% on health care costs in the U.S. by shifting to a whole foods plant-based diet. Wow. Now, that's very much in our interest. Absolutely. So, and then it's also in our interest to support a food system that's not destroying the planet like animal agriculture does. Yeah. So if we made choices that were aligned with our values and our interests, we would see a massive shift in our food industry. Yeah. Well, I one of the things I know is over the past six months eating a plant-based diet, again, I'm experimenting, guys, I have seen a massive shift in how I feel. So, you know, I just invite everybody out there to consider this and, you know, do an experiment, see what happens. Yes, we, we all have to make our own choices, but yeah. it's important for us to make informed choices and to look at the empirical evidence. And just because we grow up a certain way with certain habits mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we should continue with those habits yeah. because in some cases they're not very good for us. <laughs> Amen to that. So Gene, what are some easy ways that people can help stop farm animal abuse in their daily lives? Well, one of the best things people can do is to be more conscientious about what they decide to eat. Mm -hmm. And the best way to help farm animals is not to eat them. Mm -hmm. And for people who are not ready to go vegan overnight, I understand that that can feel scary. There are things like meatless Mondays, where mm -hmm. one day a week right. you are meatless. And then you become familiar with the kinds of foods that you can eat and that you enjoy. And then ultimately what often happens is people start eating those plant foods more frequently over the course of the rest of the week too. Yeah. So I think Meatless Mondays is a great way for people to start moving in this direction. And, and also going to farmer's markets and getting closer to the source of your food and eating foods in season. And these mm. tend to be healthier, more yep. nutritious. Eating a fresh peach, for example, in the summer can be very refreshing <laughs> and very energizing. Yeah. And in the winters, Eating root vegetable stews, for example, can be very satisfying and hearty. So eating in season, paying more attention to our food, and what it does to our bodies also. If you eat food and then you tend, after you eat a certain kind of food, to have cramps or other health issues, pay attention to that. Yeah. And then choose foods that make you feel good instead of foods that make you sick. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that, that goes to be just paying attention to your health. It's so important. You yeah. know, I think, you know, human beings are very complicated, but we're also pretty simple. 
but we can tend to rationalize things Mm -hmm. and to not pay attention. Or if something isn't right or we don't feel good for whatever reason, we can come up with rationalizations why it's normal. But bad doesn't have to be normal. We can eat food that is nourishing and, and energizes us instead of food that makes us sick. And, and also we can support a food system that's very healthy for the planet. So yeah. it's paying attention and being mindful and then making choices that are aligned with our values and our interests. Beautiful. So I want to just do a shout out to you on a couple of things. First of all, you've recently been selected by Oprah to join her Super Soul 100 Dream Team of 100 awakened leaders who are using their voices and talent to elevate humanity. First of all, congratulations. That is one of those epic moments in life I can only imagine. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, that was an amazing honor, and it was wonderful to meet Oprah. She wants this world to be a better place, Mm -hmm. and she is actively engaged in efforts to raise awareness and to encourage people to live more mindfully and in a way that is more compassionate for everybody. So uh, it was amazing to meet her, and I'm just so grateful to be included in her group there. Wow. Well, and congratulations. And, And so also tell us about your recent partnership with comedian John Stewart and his wife Tracy to open a new farm sanctuary location in New Jersey. That sounds epic as well. (laughs) We are so fortunate to be able to work with John and Tracy Stewart to open a sanctuary in New Jersey. And the way that partnership began actually was when a copy of my first book was left in a vacation rental house in New Jersey. And the Stewart family rented that house. Oh my God, I'm getting chills. Really? Isn't that crazy? Oh, nice. Tracy, John's wife, saw the book, picked it up, and read it, and then we connected, and we had dinner a couple years ago, and I told John that I had a new book coming out, and he said, well, I have this show, and I ended up being on The Daily Show with John Stewart talking about the new book, Living the Farm Sanctuary Life. Uh, Since then, Tracy has gotten more involved with Farm Sanctuary. She's on our board of directors, and now we're working with John and Tracy to open a sanctuary in New Jersey that will be largely an educational facility. There will be some animals there where we do education about the lives of these animals, Mm -hmm. but we'll also be talking about ways that people can live more compassionately and eating more plant foods and and fewer animal foods. (laughs) Nice. That is cool. Farm Sanctuary has shelter locations in New York and California, so tell us about them. Can the public visit them? Yes, Farm Sanctuary has facilities in New York and California, and we encourage people to come visit. People can learn about our visitor programs and our tours and events at Mm farmsanctuary.org. We also have overnight accommodations at our sanctuary in Watkinsville, New York. Wow. And for people who are interested, we also have an adopt-a-farm animal program. And in some cases, people adopt animals into their homes. But for most people, it means sponsoring an animal who lives at Farm Sanctuary. So uh-huh. you, you can help us take care of these animals, and we send you pictures of the animals who are living at the sanctuary that you're helping us to, to take care of. Wow, how cool is that? I mean, oftentimes people take pictures of the animals that they sponsor at Farm Sanctuary and put those pictures up at work. Uh, every year for Thanksgiving, we have a celebration for the turkeys at the sanctuaries, and we have an adopt-a-turkey program where we encourage people to save a turkey uh-huh. instead of eating one at Thanksgiving. <laughs> and oftentimes, people put those pictures up in work, and those become very good conversation um, starters. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to ask you for one epic moment in this process of creating Farm Sanctuary. There's got to be one that just moved you. What was it? Yes. Um, I think I would have to say it was the rescue of our first animal. Farm Sanctuary started back in 1986 with investigations of farms, stockyards, and slaughterhouses. I felt it was important to see firsthand what was happening and to be able to document it. And we were at Lancaster Stockyards in Pennsylvania, which is the largest stockyard east of Chicago at the time, and came upon the dead pile behind the stockyard, Uh where there were dead cows, dead pigs, dead sheep. And off of this dead pile, one of the sheep lifted her head. She was still alive. Wow. So we took her off the dead pile, thinking she would probably have to be euthanized. We brought her to the veterinarian, but as he started examining her, she stood up, and she ended up living with us for more than 10 years. So that was Hilda our first rescued animal. 
And since that time, we've rescued thousands of others. But Hilda's rescue really set the tone for our sanctuary work, where we try to transform lives. And once the animals come to Farm Sanctuary, they're our friends, not our food. Yeah. They get to enjoy life. Yeah. They get a second chance. And I think that the hope that comes from that is inspiring for people as well. Yeah. So I know little about the interface between industrial farming and what you're doing. And I can only imagine these days, and, I, and I've read stories, I've seen things, that there's this huge pushback from the industry to make sure that that kind of stuff doesn't get seen. What kind of, what kind of struggles have you run into with, you know, making this stuff known and, you know, getting your hands slapped? Yeah. Well, agribusiness doesn't want people to see what's happening at these factory farms because these conditions are so horrendous that consumers would be appalled. So the industry has tried to pass laws called ag-gag laws mm -hmm. to make it illegal to document and expose their abuses. And these have been going on for many years. The industry has also passed laws to exempt farm animal cruelty from state anti-cruelty laws. That's been another challenge we've wow. dealt with. So I believe that the political process is one that is very slow and very tedious. It's important to be engaged in it. But I think where the big change ultimately is going to happen is with people voting with our dollars and not supporting this industry that is so horrendous. Yeah. And instead, to support farmers markets, to get to know local food producers, and to become engaged in more of a community-oriented food system. Uh, so I love community-supported agriculture programs. Mm -hmm. I love farmers markets. Yeah. I love connecting people to their food. And the more that happens, the more responsible I think consumers will be. But when we're removed from our food and mm -hmm. when we see labels at the store that say, for example, animals are treated humanely, oftentimes those labels don't really mean what they say yeah. or they sound a lot better than they are. So the closer we get to the source of our food, the better. Yeah. And amen to that. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to shift on you and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure and what you might have learned from it. Well, one of our early efforts had to do with a, a campaign to prevent this horrendous pigeon shoot in Higgins, Pennsylvania, which is a very rural part of Pennsylvania. And every Labor Day, the town people would come together to shoot pigeons and drink beer. And wow. us animal people started coming out and saying that that was cruel and it was violent and it needed to stop. So we started showing up at this pigeon shoot and we would start yelling at them. And then they started yelling back at us. And ultimately, we all look like a bunch of jerks. <laughs> Nobody was really having a, a, a reasonable discourse. Yeah. So we learned that that was not very effective. We stepped back. We changed our tact. And instead of yelling at them, we just started documenting conditions, videotaping what was happening, mm -hmm. and trying to rescue birds whenever we could. Mm -hmm. And with that shift, the tone completely changed because our behavior now was nonviolent. It was peaceful. It was yeah. aligned with a compassionate movement. And their behavior actually became even more violent. Ooh. They started trying to get to the pigeons that were injured before we could. And, you know, we were trying to rescue them. But what they started doing was they started literally ripping them up in front of us and oh. biting off their heads, doing some ugly, ugly things. Mm -hmm. And then it was clear that their behavior was not very humane and things shifted, and ultimately we were able to get that pigeon shoot shut down. But it, to me, the message was that nonviolence yeah. is really the best way to go. Yeah. It really speaks to how the Martin Luther King Jr. approach is impactful and effective. The Mahatma Gandhi approach mm -hmm. is impactful and effective. And, and that, to me, was a, a very big learning experience. Yeah, cool. So what do you consider your biggest success? I think my biggest success has been maintaining a level of respect for others who I disagree with, mm. uh, being patient and understanding when things don't go the way that I would like. And this is an ongoing process that I'm continuing to work on. Yeah. So, so to me, it really is about living in a way that is respectful. And to me, it's an ongoing 
struggle and a challenge. Mm -hmm. But when I'm able to speak with people who disagree and see positive changes, that feels very good. And one example of this actually was when we first got the farm up in Watkins, New York, uh, our first sanctuary, and learned that across the street from us, there was a fur farmer who was raising hundreds of foxes in cages and then killing them and skinning them and selling their fur. Mm -hmm. So this was something that was like the antithesis of what Farm Sanctuary stands for. And although there was a lot of sort of opinions about him that were not positive and we wanted, you know, some people wanted to go and kind of scream at him, Despite that, we invited him over to Farm Sanctuary events, and we engaged with him. Oh, nice. And after several, after several years, he came to me and he said, you know what, I really don't like killing the foxes this way. And then he asked what kind of vegetables we like. And then he got out of the fox business, and he opened a little vegetable stand. <laughs> nice. So seeing that kind of a shift is beautiful. Yeah. And so I think, you know, for me, one of my greatest successes is speaking to people where they are, yeah. and respecting the differences, but looking for the common ground and building it. And, yeah. and that story of this fox farmer, I think, is, yeah. is an example of that. Uh, another epic moment, yes. Wow. So what drives you? What drives me is the desire to create a better world, simple as that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and I believe that we are connected with other animals, with other people, with everything here on the planet. And that if we can live in a way that is compassionate, that that ultimately spreads. And so I'm driven by this desire to create a compassionate world and also realize that we are imperfect humans, that we're going to make mistakes, but that doesn't mean we should give up, but that we should just continue striving to do better. And it's an, it's an ongoing learning process. Yeah. I'm all about education, and I have to know, is there a book that's been influential for you in this process in your life? Well, one of the books that I think has been very impactful for me and for our nation was a book written by John Robbins in the mid-1980s oh, called yes. Diet for a New America. Yeah. And he outlined some of the most compelling arguments in that book for the benefits of eating plants instead of animals, uh-huh. including the animal cruelty issues, the environmental impact issues, the human health issues, and that book came out right around the time that Farm Sanctuary was founded, and I think it actually helped Farm Sanctuary to grow as fast as we did. So I'd say Diet for New America was a very impactful, important book, and it's still relevant today. Absolutely still relevant today. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? I think... You know, the, the main thing I would say to people is just to pay attention to what you're doing and try to do things that you can feel good about and that are good for you. And when it comes to our food, our food choices have profound impacts, yeah. and we need to pay attention to those. And then if we can make choices that are aligned with our values and aligned with our interests, we can all do an awful lot to make this world a better place. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show and sharing your experience with us today, Gene. It has been a treat getting to chat with you. So nice speaking with you, Greg, and I hope to visit your urban farm there in Phoenix oh, yeah. in the not too distant future. Love to have you. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? Well, you can go to the Farm Sanctuary website, which is farmsanctuary.org, and Farm Sanctuary and Gene Bauer, we both have public Facebook pages mm-hmm. and Twitter accounts and Instagram accounts. Perfect. And if if somebody wanted to support Farm Sanctuary, how would we go about doing that? For people interested in supporting Farm Sanctuary, you can go to our website, which is Mm farmsanctuary.org, and there's information there on making donations or getting involved with our different programs or visiting sanctuaries. Perfect. So, And we can sponsor an animal. Yes, you can sponsor an animal through our Dr. Farm Animal Program. Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And you can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org backslash farm sanctuary. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Greg Peterson here, and I want to thank you for listening to the Urban Farm Podcast. We wouldn't be able to keep doing these great shows without you. So as a token of my appreciation, I'd like to offer you access to a list of our top 10 episodes I personally find most inspiring. 
If you enjoy the Urban Farm Podcast but don't have time to listen to every one, then you will love this list. Although all our guests have great information to offer, if you are short on time, these 10 are must-listens. To get access to the top 10 most inspiring podcast episodes, text FARMER to 44222. That's FARMER to 44222. And enjoy listening. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.